This was a most vicious and cruel murder with sadistic overtones. A really terrible murder that shocked the whole community around here. Even in Northern Ireland? Even in Northern Ireland terms, this is the worst. I have some 28 years experience in the RUC. I've investigated quite a lot of murders, and this is certainly the worst in my book. I made the decision because of the injuries that you had received to keep the coffin closed. They kept asking, why, why is the lid on the coffin? Why can we not just take it off? And how can you tell somebody that the way you see Marion in that coffin, that's going to be the image you carry for the rest of your life. My dad was born and reared in Belfast, and my mum's from Lurgan, so she was, and then they moved to Poor Down. So we were all born and reared in Poor Down. There was five boys and two girls, and then my mum and dad was a total of nine people. Brent was the oldest, and then it was Jim died in England, and then it was Una, and then it was Ding, Jared, myself, and, and then Marion, God rest her. It was a really happy upbringing, right? It was a really good, close family. You know, we, had, we were really lucky. We had a close family. Most of my time as a youth was on the Horland field. Brandon played, Jim played, Jared played, Berger played, I played, Marion she played Camogie. That's the women's equivalent uh, to Horland. She was pretty sports oriented, you know? We had no good times together, you know? Used to watch her playing Camogie, you know? She wasn't that good, but she was. <laughs> uh, I hope you're not listening to me. <laughs> me and Marion played together when we were very young. Then we went to primary school. We knew each other, but I don't think we were in the same class. And um, then we went to um, up into the secondary school, and we were in the same class. And that's when we really started running about together. I always remember Daddy turning around saying that she was going on to be a nun whenever she had left school, because there was a couple of girls that she went to school with that they had, had went on to be nuns. And then, because the money was tight and stuff and all, she went to work in the Ulster Laces with my sister, Una. Marion was, when I look back now and think about it, she was the kindest, most generous person that you could want to meet. I can remember one time my daddy had bought me a wee gold signet ring for my birthday. And of course, I lost it. And up the town one Friday, after Marion had started to work, she went into a jeweler's and bought me a wee ring, the same, the exact same, so I wouldn't have to tell my daddy I'd lost it. She was just a lovely, lovely person. So any, any problems she had, she come to me, and I had to go and sort them out. <laughs> but, you know, she was, she never really got into any trouble or issues, or she was a really good kid. I was doing roadie for the band the Tuxedo Junction. We were playing up in Haddon's Quarry, up in Achnacloy. It was like a charity dance, and that, it was a fundraiser. And it was just that afternoon that uh, Marion and uh, our friend Nuli asked, could they go to the dance that night? 
She come to the dances when we were playing in Portadown in St. Mary's Hall. You know, I just got brought her in with me and so we got into the dance. But that was like a local dance, you know. But on that there and traveling, no, that was the first time. They were Catholics in Portadown at a time that things were difficult and when you went out, you were sort of braced for trouble. So Marion's family thought that in allowing her to go off to Ochnacloy, a wee country village, with her brother there with her and, you know, people around her that she knew that she would be safe and that she would be safer probably than going out in Portadown. I had to get permission to go and my mummy wasn't a bit happy. She says, don't you ever do this to me again? But I, I got anyway. And we went up, up, back up to, to Marion's house and she had to lend me clothes to wear because I, I don't know what I had on by that time, but it wouldn't have been fit for her to go to a dance. They were, you know, really excited that they were going to the dance, you know. And then they were all excited that they were going with the band, you know. Look at us, we were with the band. Even when you're in the band, they're like, we're teasing the young lassies, you know, about going to the dance, you know. Do you know where you're going? This ain't no hotel dance, you know. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a big barn. It was actually seemed to be a pretty good, relaxed, you know, good entertainment, people enjoying themselves. You know, it was a good atmosphere. Tony seen her dancing with that one. He come he just he come over and asked her to dance and she got up with him. She was having a lot of fun. You know, she seemed to be enjoying herself, yeah. Somebody that was sitting beside me asked me to dance, and I said no. <laughs> but I've seen them a few times around the dance floor, you know, as the dance went on. And then I sort of seen her going out. Going out the door. And that was it. As Marion went out the door, Isidore and this girl were coming in. The girl that I was with, she seemed to have known him, you know, so it's okay, somebody knows him, so everything will be okay. They just said they were going for a walk. That was her intentions, what his intentions was, I wasn't sure, you know. All the band and Nula and me, we all sat in the van waiting for her to come back. And then it got into 1.30, quarter to two. So we said, there's something wrong here. There was no sign of, there was no life at all, or there was nothing about, you know? We knew not to go over to the right of the building because that's where the quarry was, and it was pitch black. Two o'clock in the morning, the house phone had rung. It was as though I had rung the house phone to see if Marion had got a left home, but she hadn't been home. There was no one, no one in the vicinity. That's when I started to get a wee bit worried. And as the time went on, it got worse, so I just said, we need to go to the police station right now. So the band dropped me in as a store. Um, off at the police station in Ochnacloy. The police station was in full swing, and there was a gentleman in plain clothes came into the police station. I noticed straight away that he was the one that had asked me to dance. Nula says, that's one of the people that was with that group in the dance. 
and he was a police officer. Somehow or other, you would think that that person should not have been behind the desk. They should have been a person who was having a statement taken from them in terms of potentially having been witness to the abduction of a young woman. Um, it's just very, very strange, and you can imagine the sense of disquiet that it created in the family. We were sitting there for a long, long time. It was too dark for them to do anything, so they had to wait till the morning time. It seems like it was several hours before the search party went out. Obviously, time is of the essence. If someone has been taken away by, by someone who has done harm to them, would it have been possible to get there sooner? The family must have asked themselves that. A police officer came out and says, the police are going to drive you around to seek and uh, find Marion, two policemen. So we proceeded to go to the road. They seemed to drive in the direction where they knew where they were going. We didn't go near the building. We drove to the edge of the quarry, and it was when we got out of the car. 30 seconds. One of the policemen shouted. When I looked over the quarry, there was, I knew right away it was, it was a body lying at the bottom of the quarry. The police officers was quick to step in to say, we need to clear this, this is a crime scene. So we went back to the car, and they radioed in, and then we went back to the clock. They cut out pipes in the quarry. Apparently, there was matches laying all around where Marion was lying. There was footprints. It was like they were doing this, all this evidence collection. His door come back, and he was in an awful state, crying and saying, she's not going down, she's not seeing her. Don't be asking her to look, look at her, you know. Then I had to call my parents to let them know what was, what was going on. It was, if you could, on this, it was the shortest, longest conversation I ever had in my life. There was very few words, but, <clears throat> It seemed to go on forever and never and ever. My mother wasn't at the house at the time. And I wasn't standing beside him, but to hear your father crying over the phone, it's, it's not a good thing. I can remember. being left alone an awful lot. You know, just feeling... awful alone. Until some stage that night, my mummy arrived. And she was in an awful state, too.
Well, it's really eleven years of age. Um, my mummy's over in Loigan, over shopping. I'm in terrible tired. We were playing football outside, and my sister Una came out, and she told me, "Says my daddy's looking used to." And back then, in 1973, you were. If you'd have done anything, you would have got a good boot up the back end. You know, and I grabbed Fergal and I was all to him, what did you do? And then went, OK, right, so we went into the house and my daddy was sitting over at the window. And he came, we just walked in and he says, there's a man behind you looking to see you. And I just turned around and all I could just see was a white collar. And then come into my head, it was just my mum has died in Lurgan, or dropped dead in Lurgan or something like that, you know what I mean? And that's what was going through my head, my mum's dead. And then the next thing he just turned and says, boys have bad news for you. Your sister was found dead this morning in the bottom of a quarry. And the ground could have opened, honestly. I was just, everything just left, you know what I mean? Couldn't believe it. <music> Mummy didn't know what happened, because she was in Lurgan, and then whenever they came in, they tore around Tyler. And my mum, oh, squealed the place down. So she did. And I mean squealed the place down. They had to actually get the doctor for her to come and get her an injection and stuff. You know, to calm her down and stuff, you know what I mean? Because I hadn't talked to my mother, I had to go home and face her, because it was me that brought her to the dance. It, we just looked at other, didn't speak for her. Sing forever, we just talked one another. And she kept saying to me, tell me this is not true. Hang sound. Um, it, unfortunately, it is true. It's, you know, and it was, that was, when I told her that, I don't know, it's something just seemed to click and change in her. That she, she was not the, the jolly, you know, smiling person that she knew she always was, you know? And that was for all, I think that she went to her grave, that she died herself. It, it, it just, just broke her heart. I was back a week or two weeks later uh, doing an interview with BBC. The police says this might provide somebody's memory. Yeah, she was, you know, a really good kid, you know, she never done anybody any harm, you know, she's always just jolly all the time, you know, practically, you know. Never really seen her in a bad mood, you know. You know. She just, overall, she's you know, such a brilliant kid, you know. Marion left the dance at ten past one with a boy she'd been dancing with, but Marion never came back. Whoever left with her either drove her or walked her the 200 yards along the main road between Ballygawley and Ochlacloy until they reached Haddon's Quarry. What happened when they reached the edge of the quarry? The signs are that there was a struggle, as a result of which Marion fell the 100 feet to the bottom of the quarry. Did you get a very good view of the person she was dancing with? Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. Do you think you could identify him again if you saw him? Yeah, I could, yeah. After we had identified Marion, the police wanted to take a statement and they wanted to do a photo fit. Could I explain what the person looked like? So Inspector Callahan and some other police officer was writing down all the all the notes and stuff like that there. And then they come back and they showed me the photo fit. I says, that's not what I told you. That's nowhere close to what I told you what the what the person looked like. See, I, all I had to go on was the length of this fella's hair, which was very long for that time for fellas to have sorted down his back. And I kept telling him, no, his hair was longer. No, his hair was longer. You know, he just kept drawing it to, to the hair, or maybe down a wee 
wee tiny bit to there. I mean, going, no, it was way down to there. You look long, like, sort of long, skinny-looking face. Like a... He looked to be older, right, than what the thing is. So, and they says, OK, we'll take care of it. And that's the photo that that went out to the news. The one that I said wasn't right. Uh, he is about five feet seven or eight in his late teens, uh, well dressed. He has long, dirty brown or dirty fair hair uh, with centre parting. Uh, this man must be got. It's as simple as that. He must be got. And we are doing everything possible to have him uh, tracked down and interviewed. The only conversation that I had was with Inspector Keller. Right? And his words was, uh, there was only 200 people at that dance. Uh, yeah, we'll clear this up within two weeks. No, it'll take no more than two weeks to clear this up. There's bound to have been people who knew him, this fellow with long blonde hair. I often wondered, did that policeman that asked me to dance, he's bound to have seen that fella from Ochnacloy. And he's bound to have known him. There's been a tremendous response from the general public on the confidential telephone. In particular, police are interested in a call they received on Saturday night from somebody who said they knew the identity of the killer. Now, that caller has the code number 952106, and the police are anxious that he or she should call again. The empty weeks you were expecting to open the paper or on the news, somebody had been arrested for a murder. Right? Two weeks went past, three weeks went past, four weeks went past. And then it started to get a bit sketchy from that. My mother was calling a Inspector Callahan on a regular basis, and he was giving her the same piece of information every time. We're still investigating. Six months later, it was the same piece of information. And yet, then, everything just goes wrong. The murder is not investigated. Um, leads are not followed up. Um, everything that could be neglected is neglected. A year later, my mother was in a, the ETU in Craig Avon Hospital for a long time. She had a major, major nervous breakdown. But it was a big funeral, so there must have been... Babies were well thought of. I left for America 31 years ago. A lot of people ask me why I went to the United States. Been honest, I think I had to leave before I'd done something really stupid. You know, people tell you that time is a great healer. I could sit and argue that point right now, that it's not. It thought long and hard about this coming home. You can't put memories to bed. You can keep them in your own head as long as you're not talking about them. Because once you start to talk about it, every picture in your head, it's in front of you. Actually, she could have been lying on that floor in front of me right now. As we speak, that's the picture you have in your head. Nobody should have to go through that and wait 40, 50 years for justice. have brought their changes. The quarry, now a landfill site, but what happened 40 years ago remains a mystery. 
40 years on, it's obviously tricky to, to jog people's memory. How confident are you that you can find the information that you're, you're looking for here? This was a significant event uh, which occurred in Ochnacloy um, in 1973, and I'm, I'm confident that there are people still in the area who have information that can assist with this investigation. Well, I've been looking at this eight years. Miles and miles of, you know, libraries and print-offs and things like that. I became interested in the Marion Beattie case back in 2013 after the PSNI made a public appeal in relation to her murder. As a young man myself, I socialised in Ochnacloy and Marion was originally from Portadown. My grandfather was from Portadown. So from the point of view of where Marion was from and where the murder took place, I felt that connection. I was looking at Marion's case then and, and other cases with the, the idea of writing a book. Looking at the crime scene. One of the things that really st stood out to me was that the glass in Marion's wristwatch had come loose, probably in the fall. Marion's watch was broken at 1.55 a.m. From leaving Haddon's garage at about 10 past one, it would have taken them about five minutes to the top of Haddon's quarry, where the car park was. In my opinion, the assailant must have had some access to a vehicle of some description. I think it's unlikely they would have walked that far going out Duck and Cloy Road in the dark just to stand in the dark. He would have to have maybe relayed to Marion that he had somewhere they could sit and talk, maybe have a kiss and a cuddle. Something happened between 1.15 a.m. and 1.55 a.m. where things changed and where Marion realised she was suddenly in a very dangerous situation. This murder was particularly cruel, particularly vicious, particularly creepy. There were a number of spent matches found beside her body. The assailant spent a series of matches to observe her and to then remove her clothing. That would indicate this was a sexually motivated murder. Amongst this disorganized scene, the doctor who pronounced Marion dead, he noticed that the buttons that came off Marion's blouse were put in a neat little pile. That would point to someone who goes from a frenzied form of behavior out of control to a control form of behavior in an instance. As a criminologist, one of the things that stuck out to me was the disorganization of the scene. Clothes flung around on the quarry floor, the matches spent everywhere. And we often find with disorganized crime scenes uh, that the offender is, in fact, of a young age. So I certainly wasn't surprised to hear that, that was the age description of the man that Marion left with. You would think one newspaper article, oh, that's all there is to find out, but you'd be amazed how in every single article there's another little thing that adds another piece adds more to the picture. Yeah, if I could just read this newspaper article from 1973. It is believed that the youth does not come from the Ochnacloy area. If he had been from the area, it is almost certain that some of the people at the dance would have recognised him. This is an article from the Belfast Telegraph that says that the police spokesman hinted that Marion's murderer 
was not a local man. From the dance hall to the quarry would have been about 300 yards back then. There was no lights, no street lights, no nothing. The place was just pitch black dark. This is one, two o'clock in the morning when this murder happened. Her killer had to have had a local knowledge or familiarity with the area. And we've spoken to people that did work in around the quarry, and they turned around and said there was no way it was a stranger went down in that quarry. Because if a stranger went down into it and he fell, he wouldn't be coming back out of it again alive. He had to know your way down the pads, because it was they, they turned around and it was just a straight drop down. There were newspaper reports also at the time that contradict that. Uh, this one is from Saturday, April 14th, 1973. So this is two weeks after the murder. Um, the feeling locally is that the youth the RUC are seeking is known to several people in the Ballygolly district. Why then will they not reveal his identity and his present whereabouts? Because, as one resident told a reporter, people don't want to get involved. At least one of those witnesses said he had at the time considered going to the police, but didn't because of, you know, reasons that were to do with the the troubles, basically, the, the, the sort of fear of going to the police, the sort of fear of paramilitary retaliation, the sort of fear of drawing attention to yourself as being somebody who was going to the police, you know, because at that time, you know, people would have been very easily um, seen as being, you know, potentially informers or, you know, what are they doing going to the police station? You expect silence whenever it was something that was done as part of the troubles or part of the conflict, you know, and, and in any community you nearly expect that. But this is different. This doesn't appear to have been paramilitary in, in, in any guise, you know, so the question therefore has to be asked, why the silence? Why the silence within that community? Some people certainly have a feeling that this man may have had some connection with the security forces, for example, which would automatically make people from the nationalist community be a bit wary about um, making reports about him because they would think, well, he's one of their own, he'll be looked after and we won't. He's probably been protected by his family and close circle. Often you find in a community or a small town like that, that such individuals do fill people with fear. You know, you wouldn't want to cross them. And if you don't have confidence that the police are necessarily going to protect you, if you give evidence against such an individual, then a lot of people do, both in the 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties. People just make the calculation, I'm staying out of them. When you bring in the troubles perspective onto a context of the widespread tolerance of violence against women, you get a really toxic mix in which a young woman like Marion just isn't protected. This is the uh, pathologist's report. Basically, it's the autopsy findings. It goes on to describe the multiple injuries that Marianne had sustained. They make for grim reading. There is one section, though, that is interesting. Uh, it mentions that the injuries were all due to blunt force, but only one was sufficiently specific to suggest how it was caused. This was the curved abrasion on the left cheek. It had clearly been made by a circular object, like the end of a pipe, about one and a half inches diameter. The information would suggest that there was a struggle at the top of the quarry. If there was a struggle between Marion and her killer, we can see the physical evidence that suggests that Marion suffered from that physical attack. But there is a possibility that her killer also had some signs of a physical struggle taking place. 
what has emerged is that a number of people were willing to come forward anonymously and say that they saw the person with cuts on his face immediately after uh, Marion's murder. There are also people who say that he behaved differently after her murder, that he got away, he went away, he got offside, he wasn't at work. Uh, he appears to have gone out of the country for a while. Um, so everything about that obviously points to him being certainly a person that the police should have been questioning at the time that you have the body of a young woman who presumably inflicted those cuts. But that was clearly never explored. Do you know, there's bound to have been something in Marion's hands, you know, a bit of him, you know. Everything is pointing to this guy. Why has he not been questioned? I had received some information regarding a number of individuals who were either looked at or questioned or people had suspicions of. It was around 2014 where I was told to go and speak to an elderly gentleman who um, told me that he had a suspicion of who was involved. He alluded to me that this individual was still alive and no longer resided in the area. He was reluctant to tell me this man's name. They made a few subtle inquiries based on the information that was given to me. To where I was given a name, I then went back to this elderly gentleman and rather than him telling me, I was able to say to him, is this the name of the man that you were telling me about? To which point he confirmed it was. There then came a point where you think to yourself, do the police know about this guy? Has this guy ever been questioned? And you just ask yourself, could this guy have been involved? After a year or two of researching into that, I decided to reach out to Marion's family. I mean, I suppose we're, we're conscious that this did happen a long time ago, but that doesn't mean there's still not information out there. Yeah. You know? Could they still, honestly, still do things that there's people didn't learn here? It's just afraid to come forward. Yeah. The leaflet, it's pretty to the point. Photograph of the Marion. Yeah. Photograph of the top of Haddon's car park. And then five questions. Do you know who the man was that Marion left Haddon's garage with? Did you see who Marion was dancing with? You know, questions like that. All right, thank you. All right, thanks. Might as well go a bit further. Yeah. Reaching out to Marion's family was a huge step for me. I had done it before, but this was different for the simple fact that Marion's case was unsolved. I could see that Jared was very, very hurt. And yet he had this strength, uh, he had this dignity uh, that was there to be observed along with his pain. I'll tell you what it is, it's a, uh, this poster here, uh -huh. right? It's a campaign about my sister was murdered in 1973 oh, in the quarry. Oh, right, right, right. After meeting Marion's family, I became wary of proceeding with the book. This was a family who really wanted help, that they felt a little bit lost. I so wondering if you could help. Is it okay if we put up that poster in your window? When I met Marion's wider family and met her eldest brother, he was a little bit distrustful of me initially. But by the end of the meeting, the same man actually said to me before I left, He said, on behalf of the BD family, I would like to thank you because you're the only person in over 40 years that has reached out to try and help us. Since 2013, obviously, I had met the family at the end of 2016. Uh, I hadn't heard anything of a follow-up in relation to where the police were at or if anything had, had come of the last appeal, there was very little. 
So we made a Christmas appeal where there was a letter sent to every church and chapel in the Ocknacloy and Ballygally areas. And uh, following on from that, there was the, the podcast with the BBC. And that was done again in an effort to tell Marion's story, to ensure that she was never forgotten, but also to put some information in the public domain to hopefully get some information back. And it worked. This is the BBC. 46 years on, the family are still searching for answers. I think it's a reality that there, through the passage of time, there are a large number of cases in which we don't have all of the exhibits gathered, stations being destroyed. On a general level, we do not have the exhibits that we did. The family found out more about the investigation into Marion's murder via public news uh, broadcasts than they were told in formal meetings with the police. The police, they had gathered matches up in figs. All the forensic evidence are with Marion's clothes and stuff down in the bottom of the quarry. We were always led to believe that there was 42 items. And then when I come across the radio broadcast, that there was 52 items, 52 or 53 items. All the items were all missing, and part of the file was missing. The forensics appear to have now disappeared. So that's absolutely disgraceful. I mean, we do know that with some troubles, murders, for example, similar forensics like matches and so on have been analysed using modern techniques and DNA has been found. You know, some of it you can you can put down can put down to the, the period of the conflict. There there were police barracks is attacked and the forensic science laboratory was attacked and robbed and there was a fire in it and whatever. But there was a lot of pieces of evidence here. The police on one occasion tell us that uh, some items are held and retained, and on another occasion we're told that they're not retained. Now that in itself only gives rise to a muddled and confused picture as to what exhibits actually in fact are retained and in what format. The facts are, and what I'm being very open about today, is that in 1973 we had a large number of exhibits. They were submitted, they were examined, and a number of um, evidential outcomes come out of those. Not sufficient to charge anybody. The news broadcast had found out that there was somebody arrested in 1973. We absolutely knew nothing about it. We know the identity of that individual, and it is not the individual whom the evidence now points to. That, that only gives rise to the question as to why the individual who the evidence now points to was never identified or in any way fell within the suspicions of the uh, police and authorities at the time. There was a very high level of disrespect shown to the BT family. Um, they weren't kept informed. People didn't come and tell them, look, we thought we had a lead on this, but it's gone cold, or, you know, we're doing our best here, but it's very hard, we're not finding it easy to get people to talk to us. You know, those things that just mean so much to a family because it makes them feel the authorities care about us. They consider it important that our beloved daughter was killed. In 2019, a letter was sent to the Pat Finnegan Centre uh, from an anonymous source. That letter pointed to the involvement of an individual. It looked a bit different from the normal letters you were getting. You know, any organisation, there's normally typed letter faces and all of this. So anyway, we opened it carefully and it was fairly obvious what it was about straight away. It did look as if the person has tried to disguise the writing in some way. Um, it did talk about a, a sense of fear within the community um, at the time of Marianne's death and, and suggested that that's maybe why people hadn't come forward. Um, and it finished off by, by saying that, that they hoped that, that Marianne's family got the, the peace and justice that they deserved. The anonymous letter was in relation to that same name given to me by the elderly gentleman. 
okay, this isn't just a name that's being bandied about. There's there's something here. There's something that could be potentially interesting, that could be substantial. Here we have an independent, anonymous source identifying the very same perpetrator to the perpetrator that the evidence the family have collected uh, identifies. Any information that we got, we eventually put it together and forwarded it on to the PSNA in the fall of 2020. But despite the family's efforts and despite the requests being made by the family, we are none the wiser as to what steps have been taken by the police to investigate that anonymous letter. We're going to meet the Justice Minister in Starmount. We're just looking to see what help we can get and see how far the police investigation has went on. Well, Robert, how you doing, mate? Too Good bad. to see you again. Where are you? Oh, not too bad. Good stuff. I think today is important in terms of a renewed sense of hope for the campaign for justice for Maya. It'll be very interesting to speak with politicians and hopefully get their support for what we're trying to achieve. I think it is important. Um, it's been a long time coming. These are meetings that have never been had before. And I don't think there's any harm in letting the public know that political figures are behind us and are supporting the campaign for justice. I mean, we still don't know why the police didn't investigate this properly. We don't know why they weren't able to use the forensic evidence that they had. When you have a chief suspect, I mean, this was a small country dance. It's hard to imagine that they could have done a worse job in terms of investigating it. This is the first time I've ever visited up here in my life. I drove past it many today. But never it's it's it. never a place I've ever been, to be honest with you. Hello, how are you doing? doing? We have a meeting with the Justice Minister. No problem, you know where you're going? Yeah, just up and then take right. Yeah, you have a good day. OK, thank you. PS and I say there's somewhere in the region of 1,500 unsolved murders or, or unsolved cases from, from the period of the conflict. I think it would be very, very difficult for, for anyone to, to categorise what happened to Marion in, in the same way as, as anything that happened during or related to the troubles, to the conflict. But all of legacy has now got lumped together. It's really hard to understand why they would have put this murder into the legacy branch um, unless it was just sort of tossed in there because they didn't know what else to do with it. Treating the murder in this way leads people to speculate. And does this mean that if we dispose of all legacy cases that a murder like Marion's goes with it? And it makes you wonder as well what other cases have been thrown into legacy that don't deserve to be there. We made it clear that there were grave concerns by the family, not only that the evidential trail had not been followed, but that this case was now going to be swept within the legacy cohort, and as such, the, that the police were now using it as an excuse to justify inaction. Both the Minister for Justice and the Deputy First Minister share those concerns and would support the family in ensuring that those concerns were reflected to the various police and authorities. I was near in tears, to be honest with you. So I was, because whenever I come out of the phone, I was on top with her for about half an hour. And then whenever I come off the phone, I went into the kitchen to the wife. And the wife told me, she me, what's wrong with you? And then I explained to her what was going on. And I was absolutely over the moon. I couldn't believe it. 
what, what has happened, you know, to a cotton. And then I had rung her on her. And then I explained to him what the detective had said to me, and he sort of went dumbfounded for a couple of seconds because he didn't know what to say whenever he came on the phone again. And he says, Jerry can't believe it. And then I had rung his door, and I turned around to her to him, and he was over the moon too. We are over the moon, and we hope it does. At the end of it, we hope it does. And we hope it is the person that we are thinking it is. And gets charged. Anna, and I just looked up at the picture, because we have a picture of Marianne up on the wall, beside my mum and dad. And I just looked up at it, and just happy days. Couldn't believe it, what was happening. The chief suspect appears to have gone into a police station not very long after the police have just discovered that there's a documentary being made about this murder. Uh, and you'd have to wonder, you know, why after 50 years does this happen? Can it be a coincidence? I go ahead to identify Marion in the morgue. A friend of mine says, what you're going to see, you're going to bring that to your grave. Her name is Marion Beatty. The truth about what happened here in this quarry near Ochnacloy has never been told. 50 years on, her murder still a mystery, her killer still out there. Marion's brother Isidore was there the night she disappeared from a dance on the 31st of March 1973. You can protect somebody so far but you cannot protect them from evil. People think that 50 years is a long time, right? But when you lie in bed at night or just sometimes you're just walking along thinking, driving the car thinking, it was yesterday. Marion was last seen alive with the man she met that night. Hours later, her body found brutally murdered at the bottom of the quarry. What impact has this had on, on you as a family? The heart. Today is no different than 50 years ago. It's more prominent that young women are being murdered, right? Uh, 50 years on, it just make it any easier. Time is supposed to be a great healer. In a case like this, <clears throat> time doesn't heal nothing. Last year, the police ombudsman told UTV they have found failings in the original police investigation. A year on, and the family haven't yet been given the full report. In a statement, the police ombudsman said careful consideration has been given to the outcome of the investigation. The report is now in its final stages and the ombudsman hopes to meet with Marion's family in the coming weeks. For 50 years, Marion's murderer has walked free. Her family believe the killer has been protected all this time. All the people who was at the dance knew who the person it was that Marion went out with. And I don't know how you can sit in the house with your conscience and it's coming up in 50 years. All we want you to do is just go to the police. If it was your, your daughter, your brother, your sister, would you not want the public or people that knew who done it to step up? On Saturday, a special memorial will be held at the murder scene and a stone from the quarry laid in her honour. So no one will ever forget Marion Beatty. But we don't know what has happened about that visit to the police station. Uh, as we speak at this moment, no one has been charged. Is there a, a particular reason as to why uh, over two months have passed since the arrest and the interview? Uh, is that a, a normal kind of uh, process, as in uh, the months that have passed without any kind of uh, uh, briefing? It's not normal. I think it's unacceptable. And I think it displays, unfortunately, the ignorance about how this has been approached to date. We obviously have provided the lines of inv investigation. We've also pointed and identified the suspect. So I think it's pretty obvious that if they have identified specific lines of inquiry or specific lines of investigation, which they believe have to be done before they can make a decision on charging, then I think we should be briefed on what those are in case we can assist. If your sister, like, it shouldn't need to be like this. Uh, 
Thank you. Going up the uh, Hutton Square in Achnacloy to meet Jordan Fergal and Bobby. I think the only reason when I'm going this time is to sort of just sort of maybe go back and say sorry you shouldn't have carried them. There's an immense dignity in the Beatty family and the, the love that they have for Marion and the sense that they want to vindicate her. They felt isolated and unsupported and they felt bewildered as to why the case wasn't being investigated. Um, they felt completely abandoned, I think, by the state. Even if the police find themselves in a position where they're gonna say, look, We've messed this up in the early stages of the investigation. We've tried to go back to it. We can't solve it. We haven't got the evidence. We haven't got somebody who's willing to admit it. We're really, really sorry. I love being home, you know? I'd love to come back here and coach Horland and, and, and Camogie and stuff like the way I used to, you know? It's quite honest, this was the happiest days of my life. It's cold up here today compared to the last time me and Bobby and them was up here. It has been uh, an ongoing struggle for everyone. My father and mother are gone. My brother Jim is gone. None of us is getting any younger. Hopefully this time we are going to get a definite closure for at least part of the family.